Just over three years ago, I started growing plants on moss poles. I had a lot of failures, but I also had a whole lot of success. So in today's video, I wanna share all of my knowledge around moss poles with you so that you can incorporate them into your plant journey as well. Hey everybody, and welcome back to our YouTube channel. My name is Jan, also known as Sydney Plant Guy, and down here we've got little Brad, my supervisor. The majority of my plant journey has been all about moss poles. It was a huge game changer for me and it really made this hobby into this passion that it is for me right now. What I love about moss poles the most is that they enabled me to grow my plants to their full potential or really close to their full potential within an indoor setting. But not everything was smooth sailing over the last three years. A lot of it was trial and error, and of course there were a lot of failures, but also a lot of success. I'm trying to be fairly structured with today's video, and I'm gonna leave timestamps down below as well, so you can skip to the part that is most relevant to you. In today's video, we're gonna cover off why using a moss pole in the first place, what plants you can use moss poles for, whether you even need a moss pole to successfully grow your plants indoors, different types of moss poles, how to make a moss pole yourself, how to put a plant on a moss pole, how to extend a moss pole, how to chop and extend a moss pole, how to water a moss pole, moss alternatives, and then any sort of other tips and tricks. Like none of this is news. I've spoken about all of these topics in depth on my channel before, and all of these topics or most of these topics have in-depth tutorials as well. So I'll link all of them in the description, but they're also in my moss pole playlist, which I'll link at the end screen. So if you want to dive into a little bit more detail on any of these topics, feel free to check out my tutorials. But let's get started. And I've taken notes, so please excuse me if I look at my phone every now and then. I'm not reading messages. I'm actually just trying to be as organized as possible with today's video, but if you've seen any of my videos before, I get really passionate about this topic, so I wouldn't be surprised if I kind of go off topic every now and then. All right, quick disclaimer as well, just wanted to let you know that this video is all about my experience with my plants in my environment using the materials that I have available over here in Sydney, Australia. I'm not saying that this is the only way to have success growing climbing plants indoors. There's many, many ways to have success in this hobby, but this is just what has worked for me and that's the only thing I can speak about. So let's start off with why I like to use moss poles in the first place. Most of the plants that I like to grow are aeroids, specifically climbing aeroids. And in nature, they're considered epiphytes or semi-epiphytes, which means that they like to climb up trees. Inside my apartment, I don't have trees to provide these plants with, so I need to give them uh, some sort of different support that mimics the tree, and those are moss poles. But moss poles aren't just mimicking a support or not just mimicking the tree. The moss pole is actually a vertical extension of the pot. So moss is a potting medium, and if you treat it like any other potting medium, then the plant can grow roots into the moss, basically giving the plant a huge area for root growth. And ultimately, the more roots, the more likely your plant will be healthy, and the more roots, the more water and nutrient absorption, meaning your plant is given the best chances of maturing and growing large. Ultimately, that was my goal over the last three to three and a half years. I wanted to take small cuttings or plants and grow them up moss poles and see how large I can grow them within my indoor setting. So providing the plant with that support as well as more room for roots just means that you're growing the plant as close as possible to its natural growth pattern. And that will basically enable you to get the full potential out of the plant. Of course, some other parameters need to be right as well, but the closer you grow that plant to its natural conditions and its natural growth pattern that it likes, uh, the more likely the plant will thrive for you. When they climb up trees in nature, they get access to more light, and as they climb up and get access to more light, they'll start maturing and growing larger leaves. So that whole vertical growing is really signalizing to the plant that it's time to mature. But I also mentioned that it's a vertical extension of the pot. Now, the good thing is that it's a vertical extension, which means that every single node, as it climbs up the moss pole, will start cre creating its own root system, which means that every single node has a really easy time absorbing water and nutrients. It's not that all the water and nutrients need to come from here and need to travel all the way up to the top leaf. Every single node, every single leaf, 
will kind of have its own root system to support it, which just means the plant has a much easier time and it's gonna be super, super handy when it later on comes to propagation. Every single node is basically air layered at all times if the plant starts attaching to your moss pole, which means then later on you can propagate or it's already propagated, you just need to chop your plant. So massive, massive propagation benefits with moss poles. And lastly, that propagation benefit is almost like an insurance as well. I've had plants where the entire root system within the pod suffered from root rot. Root rot is caused by bacteria and it can spread really, really quickly. So anything that's in that pod, once that bacteria starts taking over, everything will be lost. But the plant survived. I didn't even notice for the first three months that it had root rot because it had all of that root system within the moss pole. The root rot won't spread from the pot all the way vertically up to the top node, right? But if you were purely relying on just the roots within the pot, then chances are that the entire root system of that plant would have been destroyed by root rot within just a couple of days or weeks even. So I really like that insurance aspect. Now, of course, it's never anybody's aim to like cause root rot, but we are dealing with nature, it's normal. Things go wrong all the time, even for me, even after three years. It's just normal, it's natural. We're dealing with living organisms over here, so things can always go wrong. So to me, it's not trying to prevent things from going wrong. It's more about having a strategy to help the plant recover if something goes wrong. All right, based on my explanation why I like to use moss poles, it's pretty clear to see what sort of plants we should be using moss poles for. I use them for climbing aeroids. So specifically philodendron, monsteras, um, some anthuriums, syngoniums, epipremnums. Um, so anything within the aeroid family and anything that's climbing. Not all aeroids are climbing. They can also be crawling or they can be a little more bushy and so on. You could try and force a plant to grow against its growth pattern. So if the plant wants to crawl along the forest floor, well, why wouldn't you just try and make it crawl up a tree? But the plant is usually smarter than that. I've tried growing uh, crawling plants on a moss pole and it just doesn't want to grow vertically. It just wants to grow horizontally. So I'll just grow them in uh, rectangular pots rather than on moss poles. It's the same principle, just flip by 90 degrees. I don't have a definitive list. There is thousands of climbing plants out there that you could possibly grow on the moss pole. But if you're just having a look through my channel or my Instagram, my plant tours or my house plant tours, you you can find some inspiration. You can find some plants that I grow on moss poles um, and maybe you could try and uh, find those in your country as well. But ultimately there is no definitive uh, list. I look at the way the plant wants to grow in the first place or I research online how other people grow that plant. Uh, and then I give it a go. But I would not recommend forcing the plant to grow against its natural growth pattern. To me, that defeats the purpose. The plant will always thrive the most if we're trying to match nature, not fight it. Now, I don't think that all climbing plants really need a moss pole. I usually use moss poles for plants that I feel like might be having a hard time growing in my environment without one. So the ones that are a little more finicky. So for example, velvet philodendrons, I just feel like the moss pole is providing them with that extra root system. It's gonna provide them with a bit of a humidity boost by the water evaporating and it's gonna help me with propagation later on as well. A Monstera deliciosa, for example, that has really small internodal spacing, is very tolerant, it's a very robust plant. That plant grows everywhere outside over here in Sydney. It grows up concrete walls and it's thriving. That to me is a plant that, yeah, you could give it a moss pole, but the work of having to make and maintain a moss pole might not necessarily be worth the effort. Whereas a uh, philodendron vericosum, for example, has very, very tiny roots, very disappointing root system, very fragile roots, and is in general a very fragile, tricky plant to grow indoors. So with that plant, I wanna try and support it as much as I can, so I'll definitely give it a moss pole. But my Thai constellation, for example, I didn't give it a moss pole. But ultimately, it's up to you and what you want to grow your plant into, and if you think the moss pole is necessary. Which leads me to the next topic. Do you even need a moss pole? Not at all. 
First and foremost, for a plant to thrive, you need to provide the plant with the appropriate conditions. I did a full video on the difference between conditions and care just recently. And in that video, I basically mentioned that the conditions are predetermined by the plant. And the closer to the natural conditions we're growing the plant, the more likely the plant will be thriving. So conditions are things like light, humidity, temperature, and airflow. None of these is moss pole. So if you're growing your plant in the perfect conditions, that plant is going to thrive and grow large leaf regardless. However, when we're talking about growing indoors, the conditions will always be suboptimal. Just purely based on the ceiling that's above me, I already know that these plants are not provided with the perfect light or like with S with as much light as they might want to. Yes, I supplement with grow lights. Uh, not everybody is uh, willing to supplement their conditions. But yeah, first and foremost, for a plant to thrive, you really got to sort out the conditions. And once you've got the right conditions, then you can just choose a care approach that suits the conditions, suits the plant, and suits your preferences to then hopefully crystallize that potential that you set with the conditions. So for me, that is Moss Pulse. I love my care approach using moss poles. I'm having a really easy time looking after them, watering them and so on. Uh, so that is my preferred care approach. But the, all the best care in the world, the best moss pole in the world, the best fertilizer and so on, will not ever be able to compensate for insufficient conditions. So no, you don't need a moss pole, but the moss pole can definitely be beneficial for your plant, specifically if you are growing them in, in indoors. Now, the other reason why I like to use moss poles is that propagation benefit that I spoke about earlier. My main limitation indoors is light, but also just ceiling height. I cannot grow these plants uh, indefinitely right like I keep all of my moss poles at a maximum of 180 centimeters so that I can still fit them through the doorways now what that means in combination with the low light or the lower light than in nature is the plant grows a little leggier than it would in nature leggier means it just has more internodal spacing that it potentially uh, would have in nature because it's looking for light it's trying to climb up that tree to get access to more light which means that on a 180 centimeter moss pole, it, it might only grow five, six, seven, eight leaves or so until it reaches the top. And then what? I want it to continuously grow so it can continuously mature, but I'm running out of space. So I cut it in half and then I continue with the top and extend that and so on. So some of these plants that you see behind me, the larger ones, or I pop some photos up on screen, They've, been going, they've gone through three, four, five moss poles to get to that maturity. If I would have not been able to chop any of the moss poles, that moss pole would now be like three, four meters tall, which is obviously unrealistic. Plus the bottom two meters would probably be empty by now. Leaves have a limited time span. So for me, it's not necessarily about the support that the moss pole provides. I will well, it is about the support that the moss pole provides, but the support can be provided by other things as well. It's mainly the support in combination with the, with the propagation benefits because it's a, it's a vertical extension of the pot. That's really the magic that moss poles uh, offer me to grow my plants to maturity in an indoor setting. I hope that made sense. So no, you don't need a moss pole. You can use other support stakes, but if you want to give your plants the best chances of continuously maturing and continuously increasing a in leaf size, then I think it's going to be really, really hard to beat a moss pole. Which is a good segue into different types of supports or different types of moss poles. Let's talk about different types of supports first. A lot of the times I get asked questions about moss poles, but people are actually referring to these coco choir poles, right? The ones that just have like this like coco husk kind of wrapped around them. Now that coco choir has really, really poor water retention and nutrient retention, which means it's not a growing medium. If you would take a plant and you just put it in that mix, probably won't really survive, but you can grow plants in pure sphagnum moss. So, these coca choir poles are not a vertical extension of the pot, they're just a support stake. So yeah, the plant can kind of use it to not fall down, but you won't have the same propagation benefits. 
Same goes with the veggie trellis. The veggie trellis is really just giving like your beans, for example, a support. And I see some people grow aeroids on these sort of trellises as well. And that is okay. It will provide the plant with support. And if you give the plant the right conditions, your plant can still mature and grow larger. But what, what, do, what are you gonna do when it gets to the top of the trellis? You now need to chop and you basically have an unrooted plant. So that will definitely set back your plant. But we're gonna talk about that in more detail when we chop and extend process later on. Now you can also use wooden planks or like a piece of bark to grow your plant on. And that's actually closest to nature. But then again, while it is close to nature when it comes to the support, it doesn't offer any of the propagation benefits. If anything, it's quite the opposite. I've grown my Monstera up a wooden plank before, like a piece of bark, um, actually a piece of iron bark that looked really, really nice, but it grew all of these roots into the bark and then it reached the top of the bark. And then I tried to remove it from the bark and all of the roots literally ripped in half and the entire root system rotted away afterwards. So I'm now stuck with my plant that has no roots. So I basically need to start from scratch, start propagating the plant and the growth will be reset. Defeats the purpose. By the time it gets to the top of the moss pile, I want it to continue mature. It just started being happy. I don't want to ruin all of my progress and start from scratch. So yes, you can use these as support stakes, but none of them will offer the same propagation benefits. They're not a vertical extension of the pot. They're not offering any additional room for the root system. Now, when it comes to moss poles themselves, I use a few different types of moss poles. So I use these open moss poles and they're really just a piece of mesh filled with moss. Easy peasy. And these I make myself. I also use these moss poles called grow vertical and they basically have a plastic backing i like this eco green one it's made from recycled plastic and it just has a mesh at the front and and then just moss inside the same company has also released this the other day it's basically just one big sheet that you can fold together and just make this plastic pole over here and you can then fill it with moss. It's also from Grow Vertical and I've got them linked in the description. And then I've also seen some self-watering moss poles where people put like a PVC pipe in the middle and fill it with water and have like a wick so that it kind of like self-waters itself which in my opinion seems to be way too much effort and it's really gonna become even more effort when we talk about the chop and extend process later on. But they seem to be working, at least in small sizes. I've heard that if your poles get too large, eventually that self-watering doesn't really work that well anymore. But ultimately, keep in mind the principle. We want to provide a vertical extension of the pot. So anything that you build vertically that can hold growing medium, in this instance the moss, will do the trick. There is no right or wrong. There is no superior moss pole. It really depends on what plant you want to put on there, what your conditions are, what your likeliness or what your willingness to water is and so on. So let's compare those two for example, the two that I like to use, the one that is open and the one that is plastic backed. With the plastic backed ones the moss makes has less surface area, makes less contact with the air so it's drying out slower whereas this one is fully open, the moss has a really large surface area and the moss is going to dry out quicker. So if you operate in a really, really humid environment, airflow is really important and plant and roots love oxygen. If you operate in a really humid environment, the open air moss pole might be better because the moss and the roots can actually breathe. But because it's humid, you don't need to worry about it drying out. If you grow in a really, really dry climate, the moss might dry out way too quickly if it's all exposed. So then maybe a plastic back moss pole would be a better option for you. But in return, you get less aeration for your roots and roots love oxygen. So you might be causing root rot or you might see fun um, fungus nets um, and so on as a result of that. As long as you stick to the principles, there is no really right or wrong. Alrighty, before we look into how I make one of these moss pots, I also wanted to show you this example over here. This is another Grow Vertical. And again, I have them linked in the description. I don't make them, I just, I just construct them and then I fill them with moss. But it's basically just a plastic sheet with wire. Now this is an El Choco Red and I hope the camera is gonna focus on it. But it's growing without a pot. So when I say that the moss pot is a vertical extension of the pot, I mean it. This plant is thriving and it doesn't even have a pot. 
because it's just relying on the moss as a growing medium within the pole to build a root system to support the plant. And so whatever pot you've got down below is fairly irrelevant as long as you treat the moss pole correctly uh, and as long as you treat it as a, as a, as a growing medium. Right? But we talk about the care uh, at the end as well. You're taking up a lot of space on this chair, my baby. Alrighty, now let's have a look at how I make these open moss poles over here. Let's make moss poles. I use a coated wire mesh, sphagnum moss, wire cutters, and cable ties. First, I cut the wire mesh and I put the dimensions of it at the end screen for you to take a snapshot. I then soak the sphagnum moss. You don't want it to be wet, just slightly moist. I fill the wire mesh with sphagnum moss and you don't want it to be too dense, but you also don't want it to be too light. So I use around 100 grams of dried moss for one moss pole. I leave the bottom of the pole empty because that part is going to be potted up in aeroid mix later on. I tie it all together using cable ties, which are then cut off. And lastly, I give the moss pole a little haircut, just trimming off any excess moss that's sticking out. And that's it. I hope you enjoyed this. All right, beautiful. So a couple of things, they're all 90 centimeters tall and that's just because the wire mesh that I get from Bunnings is 90 centimeters tall. That's it. I didn't think it through all too much, but the good thing is when I then extend the moss pole and I put two on top of each other, it becomes 180 centimeters, which is just a perfect height to still fit through doorways and so on. I decided to make them six centimeters in diameter because I feel like that is the perfect mix between it being too skinny or too big. If it's too skinny, it can't hold much moss. Well, moss is the growing medium, so you're not really providing a big vertical extension. You're not providing the roots with much room to actually grow into. If it's larger, it means it holds a lot of moss, which means when you, water, uh, when you later on water your moss, it can become really heavy, it can fall over, or the likeliness of it falling later on might be a bit higher because it can get really really heavy. Also the bigger the moss pole the more moss it will use and moss can be fairly expensive depending on whereabouts you live. So you're more resource efficient. So I found the six centimeters just to be a perfect balance between those two. The mesh doesn't need to be um, coated. This one is a coated mesh but you just don't want the uh, mesh to uh, rust. So I think if it's galvanized that should also do the trick. But you want to make sure that the wire in itself is strong enough to stand up. I've got a spare moss pole over here. My moss poles can just stand by themselves. I don't need to do anything to kind of support them. It's because the mesh in itself is strong enough and the six centimeters also seems to be large enough surface area for this to stand on. If it's really tiny, it, will, it, it doesn't have a much surface area to stand on, right? So that has worked for me, but of course, there is no right or wrong approach as long as you keep these principles in mind. The number one complaint I get about moss poles is the care and that, you, it that they dry out too quickly and it apparently takes a lot of time to water them. I'll show you my watering approach later on and let me tell you, it's a walk in the park. But if your moss pole dries out too quickly, it's probably because you're not using enough moss. Moss is the growing medium. The more moss you've got in your moss pole, the longer it will retain moisture. So if you just flake a little bit of moss in your moss pole, of course it's going to dry out really really quickly. So I use about 90 grams of dried moss per moss pole. So a pack of 500 grams that I can buy at Bunnings makes six moss poles for me. And again I found that to be the perfect medium. If, if, if you pack it too densely then uh, it's not aerated and uh, you know roots might actually have a hard time even penetrating it in the first place. So I found that to be a good in between you know but if you are worried about your moss pole drying out too quickly because you put them in a really dry environment, just try a plastic back one. Another reason why I don't like the self-watering moss poles because if you put a PVC pipe in the middle of the moss pole, then you're taking away a lot of space for the actual moss. So you just then have a really thin layer of moss around your PVC pipe, which means that, well, you don't have much moss to absorb the water in the first place. So you don't have much growing medium. So where are the roots gonna go, right? Like where, what are the roots going to attach to the PVC pipe? And you're gonna have the same issues before the PVC pipe is not a growing medium. So anyway. I think you might know how I feel about self-ordering moss poles, but that doesn't mean it can't be done. I just personally never really felt the need to do it. 
Alrighty, so now we've made a moss pole. I always make them in bulk as well. Whenever I make moss poles, I make them in batches of six. There's no point in making all of that mess just for one moss pole. So I make them in batches of six and then I put them in the sun so that the sun can also kill any sort of um, mold spores and so on, at least in theory. And so far that worked really well for me. I haven't had any mold issues with my moss poles, uh, but I also ensure that there's always airflow. Uh, if your moss pole starts uh, showing signs of mold, it's probably because there is a lack of airflow in the first place. But that trick of keeping them in the sun for you know a couple of days until they're dry has worked for me really well. And then once they're dry, I can also store them uh, anywhere I want. And then I just always have one handy in case I need it for example extensions or for a new moss pile and I don't need to procrastinate because I don't have one handy. Alrighty, now you've got that plant and it's ready to put the plant on a moss pile. Let's have a quick look at this video. Let's put this plant on a moss pile. This plant has a decent root system so it's ready to be potted up and given a moss pile. I usually wait for at least secondary roots. I also need a pot, a pole and some aerod mix. First, I take the plant and I pin it to the part of the moss pole that I want it to attach to later on. To pin it, I just use this piece of wire that I shaped into a U and I just use the grid to pin the plant to the pole. I then flip it upside down so that I can fill the bottom part of the pole. That bottom part is going to be inside the pot, so I don't want it to be filled with moss, I want it to be filled with aeroid mix. I then carefully flip it back and top it up with more aeroid mix. I can now remove the pin, it's no longer needed, the plant will attach itself using aerial roots and for more stability I now put the pot into a heavy decorative planter. And that's it. All right, first things first, when we're potting up our plant on a moss pole, all the, norm all the normal rules of repotting apply. We are still potting up just a normal plant in a pot. All we're doing is we're adding a support stack to it as well. That's it. We're not actually, it's not a whole new ball game. It's the same thing. We're just adding this steak in it at the same time. Please, please, please make sure you start the moss pole at the very bottom of your pot. Like you want it to be all the way down there. You don't just want to put it in in hindsight. Of course it's going to be super wobbly. You need that moss pole all the way to the bottom of the pot and then fill it in with aeroid mix and that is what's keeping the moss pole in place for me. I do not connect my moss poles to the pot. They're just held in by initially the um, aeroid mix and then eventually once the root system expands they're all held in by the roots. I don't need to cable tie anything over here. I've seen people like even super glue or cable tie from the bottom which is something you can totally do but I really never had the need to do it. And I think it's mainly because my aeroid mix that I use is really, really chunky. So please do that first. And the reason I don't like to have moss uh, um, at the bottom of the moss pole is because that moss would then just be covered by aeroid mix and the moss has too much water retention. I'd rather have everything inside the pot be aeroid mix. So that's why I always keep the bottom of the moss pole empty. This is probably a little bit too full. I made this one for an extension. I would probably stop over here and have this part filled with aeroid mix instead of moss. Now I like to start my moss poles with plants that are really really small and let me show you this example of my uh, Monstera adensoniae for example. Like I got it as um, one, one like cutting and I cut it in four single nodes. I propagated these four single nodes and then I popped them in a pot and I just put a moss pole in the middle of the pot and then eventually these plants want to find something to climb on. So they find the moss pole and they start climbing up that moss pole. And now three and a half years later this is what my Adansonia looks like now. So because I gave that plant a moss pole when it was still really small every single node as the plant was growing up that moss pole was able to take full advantage of the moss pole, grow a root system in to the moss pole and enabling the plant to grow larger and larger. If you have a really long established vine already and you just put it on the moss pole in hindsight, chances are that only the top node will start attaching to your moss pole. Plants work with growth hormones. The plant is going to send growth hormones into the part that's currently growing, which is usually the top of the plant. So where the growth hormones are, this is where the new roots will grow. Specifically in an indoor environment, you probably have suboptimal humidity. So the roots will have a really, the older nodes will have a really, really hard time growing roots. If you're growing in perfect conditions, you have like a greenhouse or a hothouse or something like that. Yeah, the older nodes can grow roots into the moss pole at any time. 
but it is unlikely. Plus, even if they grow them in hindsight, the leaves won't miraculously increase in leaf size in hindsight, right? Plus, you're already at the top of your moss pole. You're soon to like extend it or chop it and you haven't, the plant hasn't even really used the moss pole in the way that it is intended to be used, if that makes sense. So I always like to start them small. The other benefit is like getting smaller plants is just more cost effective. And to me, that's that's the part of the hobby that is the most fun, like getting a small plant, growing it up a moss pot and seeing how large I can grow it. That was me, not I bought this, right? Like seems to be a little, uh, unrewarding to just buy an established plant and put it on a moss pole in hindsight. Also, if you already have a really mature established plant, why bother giving it a moss pole? It clearly didn't need the moss pole to grow large in the first place. The whole idea behind these moss poles is that I'm enabling my plant to grow larger. All right, and eventually the plant's gonna reach the top of the moss pole, but we wanna continuously see it mature, so we wanna extend the pole so the plant has more room to grow. I wanna extend it with another 90 centimeter pole. But first, I'll give it a larger pot just so it has a bit of a wider base to stand on and it won't fall over. I'll give it a 20 centimeter pot. Before, so you can see there's some roots in here. I don't really do anything with this. I'll just pop it straight to the bottom of this pot. Always make sure you put it all the way to the bottom of the pot, otherwise it won't really be stable. That means that some of these leaves will now actually be covered by potting mix, but that's okay, I want to focus on the top of the leaves, not the base. Beautiful, so now that I've potted it up, it got a larger base to stand on. I'll use a garden stake, I'll pop it in the back. With some cable ties, I'll now connect the pole to the garden stake. And that stake, I mean, it might give the pole a little bit more stability, but mainly that stake helps me extend the pole. Um, and connect the two poles to each other. Now take my spare pole, I'll extend it with another 90 centimeter pole. I always make all my poles 90 centimeters. That way it's just easy and consistent. I always make them the same diameter as well, so I know that all of my poles will fit each other. So they're always six centimeters in diameter. Connect them using some cable ties and connecting the joints over here. So I'll do that quickly. Perfect, I'll cut off all the cable ties and I also take the cable ties and I twist them inwards so there's no sharp edges for any of the leaves or any of the neighboring plants leaves to kind of get hurt. Alrighty, that's it. And again over here I just use 90 centimeter moss poles and I make all of the poles the same diameter so I can just always easily extend all of them but ultimately it's up to you you can do the same process with like 30 centimeter moss pots and so on but just keep in mind every time you extend the moss pole there's like a you know where the two moss poles meet it's potentially a weak spot so if your moss pole is made out of like 10 different segments it is going to be structurally less sound than if it's just made out of two and some people overlap the moss poles by a little bit. Some people use the garden stake in the back. Some people don't. Some people put the garden stake in the middle. Again, there's no right or wrong, just as long as you stick to the principle. But that's obviously not a forever solution. Eventually, the plant is also going to reach the top of its extension. And there, by then, we're already at a pretty decent height and we can't really extend our moss pole further. Otherwise, well, we'd be hitting the ceiling. So what I then do is something called chop and extend. And it is exactly what it sounds like. I chop the plant and then I re-extend it. So let's have a look. Alrighty, let's have a look at the chop and extend process. First of all, I separate the two poles that I previously extended. So I cut all of the cable ties and then I'm gonna keep working with the top. Now for this to work, it is essential that there's roots within the top half of the moss pot and you can see those chunky roots that my Monstera dubia has grown over here. I've removed as much moss as I can and I've replaced it with aeroid mix before I then flip it inside a new pot that I then top up with more aeroid mix. And from here on, it's just a normal extend process. I add a garden stake in the back for stability and then I add another 90 centimeter pole on top of it and it's all secured using cable ties. 
Now you might experience some setback when it comes to leaf size due to the plant now focusing on re-establishing a root system. But given that it already had a decent amount of roots within the moss pile, that should be overcome pretty quickly and you're basically reducing as much stress as possible. Right, let's break down this concept a little more. Now, first and foremost, this entire chop and extend process is only going to work if the plant has thoroughly rooted into the moss pole. It 100% relies on the roots within the moss pole because after I chop that plant, I continue using the top half. And the top half is not connected to the pot anymore, right? The entire root system of that top half is within the moss pole. That's also another reason why I like to use 90 centimeter moss poles. If you would make smaller segments, let's say for example, I would only choose the top 30 centimeters, I take that cutting and I chop it back up. Well, the top few nodes had had the, have had the least time to root into the moss pole. So they have the least root system so far. Whereas if I take a full 90 centimeter moss pole, I probably have five, six, seven, eight nodes on that moss pole and the oldest nodes have had plenty of time to grow de a decent root system. So I then have a root system that's in proportion to the size of the cutting. And that is super important. If your root system is not in proportion to the size of the cutting, then your plant is not gonna have enough roots to sustain or to support that cutting and it's gonna drop some of the leaves and the new growth is gonna revert. With the way that I do my chop and extend and I've done it I reckon 15 to 20 times now over the last few years, my plants hardly revert after the chop because they have a decent root system within the moss pile. They've got decent leaves to still photosynthesize and so on. So the plant hardly skips a beat. Obviously, if you provide it with sufficient conditions, you can't do a chop and extend and then take it and put it in a dark corner and expect it to grow. Conditions always set the growth potential. Now, of course, I use the top half because the top half is the one with the fresh leaves, the new leaves, the beautiful looking ones, the more mature ones. The bottom half, well, these leaves are slowly going to deteriorate, right? Leaves only have a limited time span, so I don't want to use the bottom half. Yeah, the bottom half has the larger root system, but ultimately I'm after an aesthetically pleasing display. So I want to use the top half. So I have to rely on the roots within the moss pole. Another reason why I like to start my moss poles small and like have the plant grow up the entire moss pole that will ensure that every node has attached to the pole, giving the plant the best chances of uh, not just surviving the chop and extent, but surviving the chop and extent without any sort of stress or with the least stress possible. Now, what about the bottom half? I get asked that a lot. I personally usually give it to friends or um, I sell them or bring them down to AJ and she might put them on sale. I just don't have enough room. But now that I have a garden, I actually started putting plants into the garden. But that bottom part is still gonna regrow, right? So wherever you chop, the tall, the upper node on that bottom half of the pole is gonna grow a new shoot. And in my experience, most likely it's gonna even grow two or three shoots uh, because it has a huge root system, but nowhere to put all of that energy. So the bottom half is also gonna grow. So you could put another moss pole in the top, bottom half and it's gonna regrow again. I do that sometimes. I don't know if you can still see this in frame, but there is a, my philodendron gigas over here, or gigas. I basically, instead of just ex taking the top and extending it, I took the top, I put it next to the bottom, and then I put another pole on top. So now, both of these plants can grow new shoots onto the new extension, and then I have two plants instead of just one on it. And I've done that before my, with my El Salvador and so on. Like, it definitely works. So that bottom half is not gone, it's not going to waste, it's still a perfectly fine plant. You're basically just propagating, but your propagation has almost like a 100% success because usually what goes wrong with propagation is the rooting part, right? Like you cut, you take a cutting, if the cutting roots, it will definitely grow leaves eventually, but it's gonna die if it doesn't root in time, right? So the rooting part, the, the, the risky part of propagation has already been done. So propagation is basically a 100% success if you use moss poles. On that note, I want to show you another thing. It's not really a chop and extend process, but it's similar to that. And I hope this is going to be visible. But I took this philodendron vernery. I grew it up a moss pole and you can see all of these beautiful roots over here that I was talking about. You can see that every node has its own root system over here now. And then I just chopped in between the nodes. 
And now every single cutting on here, I've got like four or five cuttings, every single cutting has grown a new shoot themselves. So there's one here, there's one here, there's one at the top over there, and I think there's one hidden down there somewhere. Uh, oh, actually, sorry, I only cut it in three parts. So I basically propagated this plant and made it really lush without even taking it off the moss pole. That's when I mean when I talk about propagation benefits. Alrighty, and from here on it's just repeat and again and again and again. I've had plants that needed a chop and extend almost every six months, specifically at the beginning when the plant is still a bit younger, it seems to be growing with smaller, uh, with larger internodal spacing, which means it climbs up these moss poles pretty quickly and then obviously depends on the season as well. So it's eventually just a copy and paste, rinse and repeat process. And that's also why I get away with quite small pots because the top cutting doesn't have a ginormous root system. So my plants aren't really root bound, if that makes sense, right? Um, and I don't really need pots bigger than the 20 centimeters because I get to, uh, because the moss pole is the vertical extension. Obviously, once the plant has become that large and it grows larger leaves, eventually it becomes more and more top heavy. So it's definitely challenging to not make these plants fall all the time. But what I found works really well for me is just putting the plants in a heavy decorative planter. Uh, and that heavy decorative planter is just giving them enough stability to not fall and makes the whole structure uh, rather bottom heavy instead. But I've seen online as well, some people like hook their poles into like their curtain uh, rail at the top or something like that to stop it from falling. Obviously, if you hang your poles, then they can't fall. So that's the approach that I'm taking in my greenhouse, for example. I just want to hang everything because then it can't tip over, right? Well, it can still fall, but it would fall from the hook rather than just tipping over, if that makes sense. Alrighty, so when it comes to care, first and foremost, let's talk about watering. I get that question a lot, like how do you keep your moss poles moist? Do you need to keep your moss poles moist? How do you stop the pot from being overwatered while the moss pole stays moist? All of that kind of comes back to two things. First of all, the moss pole is a vertical extension of your pot. So treat it the same way that you would treat your potting medium. You wouldn't not water your potting medium and expect your plant to grow in it, right? Of course you're gonna water your pot. So of course you need to water your moss pole if you want it to be a true extension of the pot. If you just want it to be a support stake, then no, you don't have to water it, but keep in mind you're not gonna have any of the propagation benefits that I spoke about in length in this video already. So I like to keep my moss poles moist at all times. So I water them and I also provide them with nutrients because, well, I treat it exactly like the pot. It's a vertical extension of the pot. I fertilize my pots, so why wouldn't I fertilize the moss pole? First of all, let's find out how I water my moss poles. Let's water moss poles. First, you need a water bottle with some holes in the lid and you need to make a little cavity at the top of your moss pole that fits the neck of your bottle perfectly. So I just flip it upside down and from here on, I'll let gravity do the rest for me. The moss makes contact with the water through those little holes, which breaks the surface tension, but at the same time, it is controlling how fast the water is being released. You want the release of water to be slower than the absorption of water by the moss. And 30 minutes later, you want to check the planter to make sure there's no excess water accumulating. That's it. Honestly, that's as easy as it is. So I don't understand when people say about how, what do you feel about self-watering moss poles? Like how much more self-watering than just flipping a bottle upside down do you want it to be? Even if you have a self-watering moss pole, self-watering moss pole is not going to take itself to the tap and top up its uh, water level. You still need to top up the water in the PVC pipe. So I don't understand how that could possibly be less work than just flipping a bottle upside down. Plus, when I flip the bottle upside down, at least I have sufficient moss in here to absorb the water. If you have the PVC pipe take up 50% of your moss pole, then what exactly is going to absorb all of the water? Uh, let's stop talking about self-watering moss poles. So let's see how I assess the, the watering needs for my moss pole. Part two of watering moss poles. Why and when? Well, first, why? It's to encourage root growth. The moss pole is like a growing medium. It's a vertical extension of your pot. When is a little trickier. The frequency changes, but one stays the same. Keep the moss pole moist, and I use a crunch test to test it. If you squeeze the moss pole and it makes no sound, it's still moist. If you squeeze the moss pole and it's crunchy, then it's time to flip a bottle upside down and water that moss pole. 
But what if the bottom of the pole is still moist, but the top of the pole is crunchy? Well, you can take your bottle and just fill it with half as much water. Flip it upside down and it won't be enough water to drain all the way through. And my top tips to avoid overwatering is number one, a chunky aeroid mix, and number two, less water, but more frequent watering. Whoop, whoop, DJ Moss Pole. Perfect, and that crunch test has worked super, super well for me. And I think that last sentence where I said that, you know, if you are worried about overwatering, water more frequently, but use less volume of water with every watering. Right? So the whole idea, the whole problem that people are afraid of, and to be honest, I've only really had that happen to me once, um, is that the moss obviously has a larger surface area, so the water is gonna evaporate from the moss much quicker. Plus gravity is obviously gonna make the water drain down. So how do you prevent the pot from accumulating a whole lot of water while the moss pole isn't bone dry? First of all, I use a really chunky air road mix, and if there's any excess water in my pot, I empty it out. So that way the plant is never sitting in water. But over the last three years, I've gotten so good at knowing how much water approximately my plants need that I actually face the opposite problem. I seem to only water the moss pole and I don't water with enough water to actually water the pot as well. I don't, I hardly ever actively water the pot. I really just water the moss pole and then the water dripping from the pole into the pot waters the potting mix. Right? Now I've done the opposite where I've gotten so good at it that my potting mix like is too dry. I forgot to water it. So what I do is I rather water a little less at the beginning and then I wait maybe 30 to 45 minutes and then I do the crunch test at the bottom of the pole and if the bottom of the pole is still dry and crunchy then I water a little bit more. The moss had more capacity to absorb water than uh, the, I, I provided water, if that makes sense. I don't know, does that, does that make sense? It makes total sense for me. The other thing is I do water the full moss pole pretty much all the time. Even though the plant is only up to here right now, for example, technically I don't need to water the rest of the moss pole. You water the roots, not the pole, right? So wherever the roots of the plant are or wherever you want the roots to be, that's the part that you should water. Roots seek moisture. So if you don't keep the pole moist, the plant is less likely to actually grow roots into it. But the reason why I grow the water the whole thing is two things, gravity. So if I just water here, the top of the moss pot is always gonna dry out first because the water is gonna drip down. So if I just water to here, the top of the moss pole is now here, which means the part that the plant has attached to is about to dry out at all times, making me really busy. If I water the full thing, the moss pot is gonna slowly dry out from the top to the bottom over the course of a week or so. So by the time it gets to the end of the week and it's time for me to water again, the bottom of the moss pole is still moist. I hope that makes sense. And at the same time, the water in the moss pot is just giving my environment a humidity boost. So I don't use humidifiers because I've just got enough plants and enough moss pots to naturally give me good humidity inside my apartment. But you don't have to. I also wouldn't really bother misting your moss pots. You're really just misting the surface. It's gonna evaporate within two minutes. You just potentially gonna cause some fungal issues. So water the moss thoroughly. Also, I avoid, I try and not have my moss pots dry out fully. Dry moss is hydrophobic. Once the moss is dry, it's gonna be really hard to re-wet the moss without making a mess. It's just gonna pearl off because it's hydrophobic. It doesn't wanna absorb the water. So in that instance, you need to really slowly mist or water the moss and only once the moss has absorbed a little bit of water, then it's gonna unlock its full water retention capacity. So if that happens, I usually take them outside, I spray them anyway, you know, I spray the leaves, clean them, and then once the moss is no longer hydrophobic, then I can just pour water down the pole and it, think, it drinks it thoroughly. But if you're just constantly wetting the surface area, you basically it's it's never gonna it's it's it, you gonna just create so much work for yourself just flip that bottle upside down and water it from the inside out and if you're worried about overwatering your pot while keeping your pole moist then just put half a bottle on there first so like fill the bottle half and put it on there first and see how far down it goes let me insert this clip over here you can see when I flip that bottle upside down you can see how the water is slowly being absorbed by the moss if that stops halfway through the moss pole, then you know you need twice as much water to water the full moss pole. 
If the full moss pole is soaked and there's excess water dripping into the pot, then empty it out. But for next time, you know that you actually used too much water. So next time, just use less volume, but maybe stick to the same frequency and so on, right? Ultimately, it's something that I've learned over the last three years. There wasn't like one moment where I was really shit at it and then the next moment I got really good at it. I just pay attention to my plants. I look at them on a daily basis. Every morning I walk around with my morning coffee, squeeze my moss pulse left, right and center and see what needs watering. I don't have a scheduled frequency of watering. I don't go around every Saturday and water all of them. If one of them needs watering on a Tuesday night, then it's going to get a bottle upside down on a Tuesday night. All right, you can tell I'm really passionate about the watering topic because I just feel like this is the one thing that makes so many people shy away from moss poles. But in my opinion, it's a non-issue. I mean, yeah, I do need to be constantly on top of it and I constantly need to flip bottles upside down on my moss poles. But that's the part of the hobby that I also enjoy. I enjoy caring for my plants. I don't just want to sit there on the couch, be lazy, do nothing, but expect amazing results. I see every watering as an opportunity to provide my plants with what it needs to thrive. Now, that was just the watering. Apart from that, all other care factors apply. Right? So you still need to fertilize your plant and I fertilize the, you fertilize the root system. Right? So if the root system is within the moss pole, you also fertilize the moss pole. Pest treatment. I personally haven't noticed any pests within the moss in itself. The moss is not alive. It was dried sphagnum moss. If anything, I see pests on my leaves, but that's not unique to plants on moss poles. That applies to all of my plants. I do think, however, with moss poles, you just need to be a little bit more conscious with airflow because you are introducing a whole lot more moisture and where there's moisture, there's always some sort of fungal issues or mold issues. I personally haven't had that issue. I don't know if it's because I always put them in the sun first or because I have decent airflow. But if you put this in a cold, damp corner, no airflow, chances that your moss pole is going to show mold eventually are fairly high. But that is not necessarily the moss pole's fault. Unless, of course, you used moss that was uh, maybe really poor quality in the first place and maybe had a lot of spores in them already. But I do think sunlight, uh, the UV in the sunlight would kill moss spores. So you could just dry it in the sun and I think that would eliminate the problem. Sorry, when we're talking about watering, I forgot to mention something that I get asked a lot. So people seem to be struggling with the water upside down thing. Let me show you that. So I've got this bottle. Hang on, I can't apply any pressure. So I have this bottle. I have three holes in it. And if I hold it upside down and I apply no pressure to the bottle, it kind of seals itself, like the water tension seals itself. It's really hard to not squeeze the bottle and hold on to it. Sorry, the water tension is just going to stop it from actually dropping. Now, oh my god, I feel like this is going to get messy. I can break that tension by touching it. I think I survived this mess free. So really, all I need to do when I top, pop it on top of the moss pile is I need to make sure that the moss still slightly touches it. You don't want it to just hover there mid-air because then, Bradley, don't drink it. Actually, you can drink it, it's just water. Um, <laughs> you want the moss to slightly touch that bottle so it breaks that surface tension, but you don't want to touch it too much so that it blocks the holes, if that makes sense. Sometimes I pop the bottle up on there and it takes five minutes for the whole bottle to drain. Sometimes I pop it on there and it takes three hours for the whole bottle to drain, just depending on how exactly I pop the bottle on there. It doesn't matter. As long as the water is released slower than the moss can absorb it, it's going to be a mess-free way of watering, which is really, really important for me because I have all of my plants indoors. If it's mess-free, if I just pop it on there and it's mess-free, there's no water dripping down whatsoever, it's the perfect way to water in an indoor setting compared to walking around with a pressure sprayer and literally spraying your whole apartment, including all of the walls. Like that's not very messy and also not very safe and like probably not recommended for mold prevention and so on. Honestly, sometimes I have four little holes in that lid. Sometimes I have three big holes in that lid. Like it just depends on what drill bit was attached to my, uh, my drill by the time I need to make a new bottle, right? Like I don't, it's, there's no crazy science behind it. Uh, I've seen people use glass bottles. I've seen people use these squeezy bottles, like the Powerade bottles. I've seen people use these, um, like, like a funnel. Or I've seen people use, uh, uh, just take a bottle, chop it in half, 
put it on top and just like permanently have it up there. I mean, I, I don't think that's necessarily aesthetically super pleasing to have like half chopped bottles on every single moss pole at all times. I've seen people use these weird, you know how you can, um, there are these little, they're supposed to like water like moss or like, like ferns for example. There's like these little spikes that you can put in the ground and then you, you put your bottle upside down on it and then it slowly releases water over like, you know, whatever, two weeks or something like that. So these things that you buy for like plants that you don't want to water all uh, too often or when you go on holidays or like these uh, bulbs like made from glass you can buy on Amazon so on. I've seen so many creative ways of people watering their moss poles. They all work. Just keep the principle in mind. Water your moss slower than the moss can absorb the water and it's gonna be mess free. That's it, there's no right or wrong approach. That bottle upside down technique is just a really inexpensive, really convenient way and it works nicely for me. So, yeah. Anyway, sorry, I should have really mentioned that earlier but I forgot. Let's talk about moss alternatives because I do know that not everybody can get their hands on moss necessarily, depending on which country you live in. I predominantly use moss and that's just because we have access to sustainably harvested uh, New Zealand sphagnum moss that is premium quality um, over here in Australia, right? It's uh, commonly available. You can just go to Bunnings and get a bag. So that's good for me, but I know that not everybody's in a position to get their hands on some sustainably harvested sphagnum moss, depend, or maybe not at an affordable price at least. So there are a few things you can do. You can use cocoa chips instead, like this plant over here, for example. So I just used cocoa chunks in here and they have decent water retention. You can use any medium in there as long as the medium can retain water so that you can water it and roots can grow into it. So I use cocoa chips. I personally found it to be super messy. When you water it, it just kind of drips everywhere rather than it just being neatly absorbed like with moss. I use tree fern fiber. This pole over here is filled with tree fern fiber and perlite. Great water retention, much easier to water as well, but it's messy. It's a really fine product that just kind of flakes out of the moss pole every now and then. So great for outdoors, really messy indoors. I wouldn't necessarily do that. I've done a moss pole with aeroid mix that's uh, no longer with me. I took it down to AJ's, I just didn't have enough room. But that also worked. If it's a medium that you can water and that it's gonna absorb water and nutrients, then that's it. It's just a vertical extension of your pot. It's like a pot, just tall instead of wide, right? So. All of that can work, but you need to keep that in mind. Like I would not grow a plant in pure cocoa chips, for example, in a pot, right? Because I believe that the cocoa chips actually absorb too much calcium or give up too much calcium, one or the other. I've experienced or like I've seen a lot of people growing them on cocoa chips and the plants get really bleached, really pale because they're nutrient deficient. It's just not really like a nicely balanced medium, but I'm not really good with pH. Proof is in the pudding though, I've seen it not work out for a lot of people. So my preference is definitely moss. Then afterwards I would say tree fern fiber is great if you can use it in an environment where you can be messy like a greenhouse or outdoors. And then afterwards I would use an aeroid mix and at the very last uh, I would probably use like a like cocoa chips. But you can try other things as well, right? As, as long as you stick to the principle and you provide the plant with a growing medium in a vertical extension, you can follow all of my other guidelines or tips over here and the success should be comparable if the plant has been given the conditions that it likes in the first place. Now, when I use anything but moss, I would definitely recommend using a plastic back moss pole like these grow verticals, just because it really reduces the surface area, makes it dry out less quickly, and it also reduces the moss. While a lot of people complain, my moss dries out and so on, moss actually has a really, really good water retention capacity if you compare it to any of the other mediums that I use in my aeroid mix. Which then leads me to some other t top tips, right? Really for this to be successful, I would recommend starting your journey slowly. Don't go and convert all of your plants to moss poles on a day, in, in one day without you having made any learnings yet. Because if something goes wrong, it's not gonna go wrong with your entire collection. I really, really slowly started my moss pole journey and my first few moss poles didn't look that good either. They were like really wonky and like all over the shop. 
it really took me a good year or so until I found like a rhythm where I was like, I think I know what I'm doing over here now. I think I found the approach that works for me. And from there, it's just copy and paste and just fine tuning. But you might still need to go through that. I'm trying to share as many of my learnings as possible with you, but I will never be able to uh, take that need to do your own learnings away from you. If you're growing in a really, really dry environment, moss poles might just not be worth the effort. For me personally, because Sydney is fairly humid, the results that the moss poles give me versus the effort it takes to maintain these moss poles is definitely worth it. If you feel like the results that the moss poles can give you are not worth the constant effort of having to try and keep them moist, then maybe growing with moss poles is not the best way for you to do. Ultimately, I, for me, it's really important that this hobby is fun for me. And I don't wanna force myself having to do something that I don't wanna do just because I'm trying to like chase this certain look uh, that I saw online, right? Uh, if my care approach would be too overwhelming for me and I don't wanna do it anymore, then that would kind of ruin this entire hobby for me. Lastly, I don't force my plants up the moss pole. The plant is growing up the moss pole naturally. That is its, net, that is its natural growth pattern and it will naturally grow up the moss pole and the roots will seek the moss pole. It will automatically attach itself to it. However, every now and then I wanna help out my plant a little bit, not because my plant needs help growing or attaching to the moss pole, but rather because I wanted to grow in a straight line or like I wanted to grow somewhere specifics to create a nice um, visual display. So what I do sometimes, and again, I hope this is showing, what I do sometimes is I have these pieces of wire over here. You see this? It's basically a piece of wire that I put in a U shape. And then I tell the plant, I want you to attach here or here or here or here, wherever I want the plant to attach to give me the look that I want. So it's really just giving the plant some help aesthetically. Um, if your plant does not want to attach to the moss pole by itself, then you might not keeping your moss pole moist or the conditions that the plant is growing in aren't really suitable for the plant or the plant is just not happy. If the plant is happy, roots will grow and they will find their way into the moss pole if you keep the moss pole moist. Alrighty, that is it for the video. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope it makes you want to try out moss poles in your own plant journey as well. As I mentioned before, I have more in-depth tutorials on all of these topics and I'll link them all in the description and you'll also see them in my moss pole playlist which will be linked at the end screen including tutorials on how to make a chunky aeroid mix for example. Thank you so much for watching, like, subscribe, leave a nice comment, share this video with anybody who could learn from my approach to plant care and I hope I'll see you next time. Bye!